Philadelphia to our Winter 21 speaker series, our virtual series. We are so pleased for everybody who continues to show up knowing that it is challenging in these pandemic times not to be able to gather together and how much we long to be able to gather face to face with you in our beautiful building um, to, to learn and engage together. But we're glad that you show up virtually for our series. I'm Beth Hessel, your executive director. We also have on screen Tess Galen, our wonderful events coordinator who helped make sure you can all get on this evening and our speaker tonight, Kathleen Cahill, who I will introduce in just a moment. As you know, uh, as one of our, our board members said at our board meeting earlier this week, she spoke about the, the importance of voluntary associations in modeling and supporting democracy. Um, from our institution in 1814 as an outgrowth of the library company, as a member supported library in the days before public libraries, the Athenaeum has promoted learning and engagement with history, with the arts, with literature and sciences and to do it all in the light of our present day context. So now more than ever, ever, I think we recognize the importance of this endeavor as, as members and friends of the Athenaeum to learn and to listen and to be in conversation with one another about what it means to be a democracy, what it means to be engaged in our community and our civic life together. And we strive to be a space for all of us to do that and invite you if you are visiting us for the first time and are liking what you hear tonight and what you're learning about our community to be a part and become a member of, of our community and let us know if you're interested in that. We would love to have you uh, as one of our members. We also recognize the, the vital importance of suffrage for all Americans and tonight's speaker is going to talk about that. But first I wanna remind you, if you are on a computer, a laptop, one of these, you should have in your upper right corner uh, a little icon that either says speaker view or gallery view. And when our when Kathleen starts speaking to really be able to see her and her slides, you'll, you'll want it to be at speaker view. Um, and in the bottom, you should see both the Q&A and the chat. And if you have any questions anytime for, for her for doing the Q&A time, please write them in either the Q&A or the chat and I will moderate those following her talk. And if you have any technical difficulties, you can put that into the chat and Tess and I will do our best to try to help you um, so that you get the best experience tonight as possible. Uh, Kathleen Cahill, who is a, uh, a professor, associate professor of history at Penn State, I have known for quite a while. And we actually just learned that we grew up a few hundreds of miles away from each other in California and just missed by a year being at the same university, UC Davis, as history majors together. Um, I've known her for, for a number of years through the Coalition for Western Women's History, where she is on this, the steering committee chair. Um, she received her PhD from the University of Chicago and taught at the University of New Mexico for 13 years before coming to Penn State three years ago. And just some other wonderful faculty uh, colleagues there who I'd also love to get talk at the, uh, to come talk at the Athenaeum. She is uh, the author of tonight's, uh, the book that she's, she's focusing on tonight, Recasting the Vote, How Women of Color Transformed the Suffrage Movement. Her first book, which is also another fantastic, amazing book to read, Federal is Federal Fathers and Mothers, A Social History of the United States Indian Service, 1869 to 1933, which won the Labriola Center for American Indian National Book Award and was the finalist for the David J. Weber and Bill Clements Book Prize when it came out in 2011. This year, she also co-edited a special suffrage issue for the Journal of the Gilded Age and the Progressive Era, Era with Kimberly Hamlin and Crystal Feimster. Kathleen, we are so delighted to have you here with us and looking forward to learning from you. I invite everybody to join me in a virtual welcome uh, to Professor Kathleen Cahill and um, turn it over to you now. All right, thank you so much, Beth. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I'm sorry that uh, I can't be there in person, but I now that I'm at Penn State, I'm so close that I'll get there soon. Um, and thank, I want to thank Tess um, also for helping to organize this and get everything um, coordinated tonight. And I want to thank all of you for being with us. Um, this is kind of a crazy day and a historic day. And so I really appreciate you spending the evening um, with me thinking about um, suffrage and uh, the right to vote. So as Beth said, um, what I'm talking about tonight is um, a history that's drawn from my book that just came out in November. 
uh, recasting the vote. And it tells the story of these six women. Um, and I'll just kind of very quickly tell you their names. So start, clockwise from the left is Nina Otero Warren uh, climbing into the car. She was a suffragist um, from New Mexico, Hispanic um, or right, we might say Latina descent. She described herself as Hispanic. Um, and she's one of the first women to run for Congress after um, the passage of the 19th Amendment. Um, she doesn't win, but she's, again, one of the first and the first woman of color. Um, in the middle is Marie Botno Baldwin, who's Turtle Mountain Chippewa and French woman, who I will be talking about tonight. Next to her is Mabel Pingma Lee, who was a Chinese woman who could not become a citizen um, of the US, but lived here almost her entire life and was um, a suffragist in New York and the first um, Chinese woman in the US to receive her PhD in economics. Um, below uh, her is Carrie Williams Clifford, who I'll talk about. She was a poet and an activist um, initially from Ohio. And then next to her is Gertrude Bonin, who was also known as Kalasa, who was also an author. And I'll talk about her um, tonight too. So um, these women, oh, and Laura Cornelius Kellogg, who I missed, who's underneath the, the images, I'm sorry. I thought, I have six, where's, where's my other person? Uh, Laura's Corn Laura Cornelius Kellogg, who was a Wisconsin Oneida woman and also um, an author. And so I'll talk about three of the women tonight, um, but the rest of their stories are in the book. And I use the book to um, uh, tell us their stories um, and to kind of talk about the world that they lived in in the early 20th century as they fought for suffrage. And then I make um, sort of two main points in the book. And the first one is that um, for all of these women who were from different groups, races and ethnicities and had different citizenship statuses, um, their fight for suffrage came out of different motivations, right? And we have to understand those differences. They're different from each other. They're also different from um, white suffragists. And that's a, an important part of the story. Um, the other big point that I make in the book is that 1920, while a really important moment, right, the ratification of the 19th Amendment, um, didn't mean the same thing for all women in the United States. Um, that amendment states that the right to vote shall not be denied on the basis of sex, but it left open other ways in which the right to vote could be denied, um, and that affected a number of these women. So that's the, the nutshell overview of the book, and what I thought I'd do today is kind of talk about some of these women and look at some of the points that we think of as um, right, big moments in traditional suffrage history, but then show them to you from different angles and highlighting um, how women of color uh, were involved in this suffrage struggle. So the suffrage um, history in the United States, women's suffrage and the history of the right to vote has a really long history. And my story picks up at the turn of this, the 20th century. Um, so I wanna just kind of orient you um, using this pamphlet from the Penn State Special Collections here with this map. So um, for, you know, around 1910, um, before that, for several decades, suffragists had really been focusing on uh, winning suffrage at the state level. Um, and they've been quite successful, as you can see, in the American West. So this starts with uh, Wyoming Territory in 1869 as the first territory to enfranchise women. And they enfranchise black and white women. And it's part of the politics of reconstruction after the Civil War. Um, the territorial governor of Wyoming was um, a radical Republican. Um, and as you recall, the radical Republicans were a part of a different impeachment uh, process. And they were emphasizing the equality of um, blacks and whites in the wake of uh, the Civil War and emancipation. It's also Wyoming territory reminds us um, that that story of suffrage was also part of the narrative of westward expansion and the conquest and dispossession of native people because native women were not enfranchised in 1869. But um, over the course then of the next few decades, a number of Western states enfranchised women. And you can see here the geography of suffrage where um, the white states are full enfranchisement of women some states had partial suffrage for women, usually around education and um, school elections. And then uh, the states that are black 
had no suffrage for um, women. And of course, we know that in the South, um, those states, uh, Black men had been also uh, disenfranchised by Jim Crow laws by the turn of the 20th century. Also, what's interesting about this map, um, it's the Pennsylvania Women's Suffrage Association, and it puts it into this continental or hemispheric um, uh, context, right, and shows both the US and Canada and Mexico, and also sort of scolds um, the states in the United States who haven't enfranchised women, you can see at the bottom, um, saying that their only parallel is Central America, Newfoundland, and the uninhabited Northwest Territories. So this sort of sense that um, the United States uh, shouldn't be comparable to Mexico and Central America or the Northwest Territories where um, very few white people lived. It's mostly indigenous people. So, um, so that's sort of the moment uh, at the turn of the 20th century this is uh, the context. And some suffragists were really frustrated by the slow pace of this state by state strategy. Um, it was tough and it expended a lot of political energy. So for example, in South Dakota, that state um, women fought for six different suffrage referendas between 1890 and 1918 when they finally won, right? So this is a lot of political energy that women are putting into this. So in 1913, um, a young suffragist named Alice Paul, whom you may have heard of, urged uh, the main suffrage organization in the country, the National American Women's Suffrage Association, or NASA, um, to fight for a federal amendment, right? To just, that should be where they put their energy and that would right, change all state laws at once. And um, she wanted to um, kind of start this, kick this campaign off with a bang. And so she plans a parade in 1913 for the weekend of Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. So this was going to be in March because it was back when the inaugurations were in March, not in January. And they hold this parade the day before um, his inauguration. And he'll have a parade too, but they, they kind of steal his thunder. And they're also taking advantage of the fact that a, an enormous number of people are in Washington, including the press, for the inauguration. Um, and so I actually start my book with this parade. And in part because I think it's a really useful example of how many um, of these key moments um, women of color were involved in, but aren't always um, kind of visible um, and haven't been very visible to historians. So. But the path to suffrage that women of color um, take often ran through very different um, paths than those of their um, sister suffragists, sister white suffragists. Um, it often went through the political activism around issues that their communities were concerned with. And these aren't always the same as white suffragists. So I want to start with um, uh, Marie Louise Bono Baldwin, whom I mentioned was a um, member of the Turtle Mountain Chippewa Nation. She uh, has both Chippewa or Ojibwe as the more contemporary term, uh, heritage and also French. And she's very proud of both of those heritages. She had moved from Minnesota to Washington DC in the 1890s um, to work for tribal sovereignty, right? This is her sort of first political um, activism. She had come with her father, uh, Jean-Baptiste Bottineau, who was the attorney for the Turtle Mountain Chippewa Nation. Um, that's in what is now North Dakota. And he had been tasked by the nation to um, contest a treaty that they'd had with the United States. Um, and they were insisting that their land was worth a lot more money than the federal government was planning to pay them for. And so they send Botno um, to fight for them. And Marie is working as his legal clerk. And so she goes with him to help. And so she spends the next decade helping him um, with correspondence. They research the treaty at the Library of Congress. They're attending meetings with federal officials um, and fighting again for sovereignty rights. By 1904, Congress um, essentially settles the treaty on the original terms. And though this is a long story, it leads them to into a court case. And in that law lawsuit, their lawyer is none other than the famous Belva Lockwood. Now you might have heard of Belva Lockwood because she was a previous presidential candidate, one of the first women to run, and she's the first woman admitted to the bar of the Supreme Court. 
and she's a major suffragist. Um, and I think that meeting her and watching her in the courtroom during the trial really opened up Marie um, Baldwin's horizons, right? She sees a woman acting as a lawyer, not just a law clerk. Now Lockwood was also on the board of a school called the Washington College of Law, which was founded by feminist lawyers to train women in um, the law because they were basically rejected by most other law schools on the basis of sex. And um, so a few years, just two or three years after the trial, Marie enrolls in this law school. Um, and she's 48 years old when she enrolls. So this is kind of a whole second career in some ways. Now, again, not surprisingly, this school is a hotbed um, of suffrage activity and she gets involved in it. And I should note that while the founders of the Washington College of Law were really adamant about sex equality, uh, they were less so about racial equality. So they often described their school as the only school, uh, law school for women and men in the city. But in fact, Howard University, which is also in Washington um, and was founded oops, after reconstruction for African-Americans, um, that law school allowed women to enroll and the founders knew this because one of them had taken classes there. So um, they also, they refused to allow African-American students to enroll in the school um, and that's the case until the 1950s. But as a native woman, Marie Baldwin faced, a, faced different kinds of prejudice and she doesn't face that discrimination. She's allowed to enroll. And she's pretty impressive as a student. She finishes a three-year course in two years and she's working full-time at the Bureau of Indian Affairs at, as she's going through school. So she's pretty amazing. She'd also become very active in a new organization called the Society of American Indians. Um, that group was very similar to the NAACP, uh, but focused on issues around Native Americans. Um, they especially wanted to disabuse white Americans of their stereotypes about Native people. And the biggest um, stereotype that they faced was this idea that they were trapped in the past, um, kind of a primitive people who were incompatible with modernity and they were gonna vanish, right? This sense that Native people couldn't move into the future. And so the Society of American Indians really pushes back against that. Um, Baldwin and her fellow um, members in that group uh, were all Native people. Um, only Native members could vote. And by Western standards, they were incredibly accomplished. Many of them also had gone to college. Um, there were a number of lawyers, uh, et cetera. So her time in the Washington College of Law and the SAI really radicalized her and she becomes much more vocal about um, her position as a native woman. And you see here um, how she's um, talking about native cultures um, being valuable and arguing that they shouldn't necessarily be um, destroyed, which was in fact the policy of her employer, the federal government, right? So she's working for the Bureau of Indian Affairs and um, the policy of the Bureau of Indian Affairs was at the time known as assimilation. So let me just very briefly give you a, a kind of brief overview of that. Essentially, since the Civil War, uh, the federal government had focused on forcing Native nations onto reservations and then became, uh, began a policy of basically cultural destruction of um, outlying, outlying tribal um, traditions, outlying tribal governments, um, and trying to um, assimilate Native people as individual citizens into the US so that at the end of this process, there would be no more sort of separate um, Native cultures or, or Native um, nations. And in outlying Native governments, they, they put Native people into a legal category um, known as wardship. So they're wards of the federal government, which means legally they're like children um, or the mentally ill, um, or the imprisoned. And sometimes um, white suffragists use this to argue um, uh, that, that white suffragists, white women should have the right to vote because they were sort of in this category with people who were wards, right? And you see here a painting um, with Francis Willard, the head of the Women's Christian Temperance Union in the middle. And the sort of implication of this is definitely which one of these is not like the others, right? All of these men are kept from voting for various reasons, as is this uh, really um, you know, nationally known um, and, and um, uh, honored woman 
So, um, so the category of wardship is going to be important, and that'll come back. The government then created a number of um, programs, as I said, to try to assimilate Native people before they could uh, become citizens if they made it, right? There's, a, there's definitely a sense they might not make it. And the two biggest are allotment, which took tribally held land and broke it up and divided it um, to create private property. And the other was education, um, and especially the creation of a federal system of boarding schools which took native children from their parents and sent them to these schools to be raised um, you know, away from their traditional cultures. And of course, you're probably aware of this because um, Carlisle, Pennsylvania is the site of the first federal Indian boarding school, which opened in 1879. And the Carlisle school becomes the model for the other 27 off-reservation schools that the federal government eventually um, opens. And the federal government often hired uh, Native people to work in some of these programs, partially because they could hire them at what they called the Indian rate, which was much less expensive than white employees. But they also thought they would sort of learn um, how to behave in what they called a civilized manner by doing these jobs and being around other employees. Um, so that's why Marie Baldwin's working for the Bureau and um, both of the other women that I write about, Native women, also worked for the BIA. But um, Native employees often took these jobs because they were some of the only um, jobs they could get. They faced great prejudice. Um, and some of them hope to work within the system to sort of make it a better system, but they often become really frustrated. So the Native women who become national voices for suffrage um, often use that experience to critique the federal programs and call for reform. And we'll see some of that. So at the Washington College of Law, um, Marie uh, Baldwin becomes active in the suffrage movement. And another sort of strand um, or conversation that, that white suffragists had around Native women was, on one hand, they were frustrated um, with this question of wardship, right, and these legal categories that white women seem to fit into. But they also were, um, on the other hand, um, saw Native um, matriarchal traditions as something that maybe could be an alternative vision of women's roles in society. And Native women um, are very happy to share their, um, right, their traditions and talk about the, the place that Native women held in their society, which was really quite different from white women, right? Um, Native women could get divorced. Native women could own, um, property uh, to an extent, right? Native women certainly controlled property. Native women um, did not lose rights to their children if they got divorced, which white women did. So there's a real interest in this and white suffragists often invite them to come and talk. Um, and so as you saw, um, Marie Baldwin in the previous uh, newspaper article gets asked about this. She talks about Native women being the first suffragists. The cartoon on the left here is sort of an, again, this kind of homage of Native women kind of being the first and kind of passing the baton, but also sort of disappearing. So there's a lot of um, ideas about Native people that su white suffragists are working through. So because Marie Baldwin's very well known in DC, she's a suffragist, she's at the, the law school, she's asked, as you see on the right hand side, um, in another interview, um, they talk about how she was asked to create a float for this 1913 um, suffrage parade. And um, please excuse the sort of language on this, this article, you can see Native women do encounter um, some of this kind of race, um, you know, racial prejudice. Um, as well. So she decides not to uh, create the float that they want, which is one to show kind of the traditional Native um, women's matriarchy, but she instead marches with the lawyers um, and she wears something more akin to what she's wearing on the left. So she doesn't look like an Indian um, to most of the people watching the parade, but she's there, right? They expect the image on the right, but she's wearing the image on the, on the left. Um, and so that's an example of sort of how um, women of color were sometimes hidden in some of these um, events and weren't really quite visible. I'm just gonna point out another woman, I'm not gonna talk about her, but in the bottom left, um, the, this is a float from the suffrage parade. And you can see the woman on the far right-hand side holding the striped flag in a white hat. 
that's a Chinese woman. Um, and we know a little bit about her story, but she's there um, and she was asked like Marie Baldwin to be there and to ride on the float. But in that picture, she's not identified um, as a Chinese woman. I, I figured that out through my research. So um, unlike native women and Chinese women, um, African-American women were not asked to be in this parade. Um, Alice Paul was really worried, as were a lot of white suffragists, that they would lose the support of Southern politicians if they um, had an integrated movement. And um, Alice Paul uh, wrote of this parade, she said, as far as I can see, we must have a white procession or a Negro procession or no procession at all. And so she um, really discourages African-American women from participating. And some of you might have heard uh, this story. It's often reported that she finally allows black women to march at the back of the parade, but that's not actually what happened. Um, black women were, were aware of the prejudice that they, right, they'd encountered this before. And they actually went to Alice Paul beforehand and said they wanted to march. And um, a woman from uh, Howard University named Nellie Quander, who is the founder and president of the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority, um, said to Paul, we uh, want to march, but we do not wish to enter if we must be met with discrimination on account of race affiliation, right? And Alice Paul sort of hemmed and haws. She says, you can march in the back. And Black women just say, you know what, we're, we're just going to march where we want to. And they sort of insist on being there. And um, they do, right? Um, many of them arrive on that day. And they march in a variety of different places throughout that parade. And we know this um, because of an article that Carrie Williams Clifford um, wrote for the crisis, which is the, um, the NAACP's uh, journal. So she had, um, she was originally from Ohio. Uh, she had been very active in women's club movements. She in fact was a founder of the Ohio Federation of Colored Women's Clubs, which was one of the um, state uh, organizations of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. Uh, that had The National Association was formed in 1896 um, and again focused on um, issues that the that Black women were concerned with. So issues like uh, lynching, racial prejudice, Jim Crow laws, but also issues very familiar to white women's clubs like childhood education, temperance, um, and poverty. Um, the first national president, Mary Church Terrell, was a, a major suffragist, and so was Clifford. So Clifford um, writes about the other Black women who are in this parade, and she names each of them and describes where they marched um, and sort of reflects on what historian Brittany Cooper calls listing, right? The, the listing of African-American women and sort of insisting that their um, names and participation are known uh, for posterity. And so black women are there in a number of different um, of the professional um, groups. So just as the lawyers marched as a group, there were others There were artists, musicians, teachers, and doctors. Black women also marched with the different state delegations of Illinois, um, Michigan, and New York. In fact, here's Ida B. Wells um, famously marching with the Illinois group. And then there's a large body of students from Howard University in the college section. So the um, Alphas, Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority marches. And then um, the newly formed sorority, the Delta Sigma Thetas, use this parade as their first public um, event. And they march um, in the parade as well. They're now probably most well known as uh, Vice President-elect Kamala Harris's sorority. So Clifford herself marches uh, with the homemakers and she marches with another woman, another African-American woman um, named Marion Butler, who, um, and her story really reminds us of the violence that black um, suffragists knew uh, they could face for fighting for civil rights. Um, so Marion Butler had grown up in South Carolina when she was a young girl um, in her community, eight men were lynched in, a, in one day. It was sort of this horrifying um, event. And her sister actually married the son of one of those men. So this was very much kind of um, alive in her family. And she believed that like many other black women that if black women could get the right to vote they could use it to pressure um, Congress to pass an anti-lynching uh, legislation. And so again, that, that violence is really quite real. And I wanted to mention another example 
there was a group of white women um, known as the suffrage pilgrims who marched, um, who hiked from New York to Washington uh, to kind of raise publicity for the, the parade. So the couple weeks beforehand, they were marching and the press was covering them. And when they got, arrive at the Maryland line, they are met by a group of white men who ask them, um, you know, if they're for uh, suffrage for black women and threaten them and say, if you let black women march with you, basically we're gonna beat you up. Um, and so this kind of um, threat of violence is constantly there. Um, and there, there are places in Maryland, there's one in particular that this image um, is representing where black women came out to march through the town with the pilgrims, but um, were ignored by them, right? In part because of that, those violent threats. So just being visible in suffrage parades was revolutionary right, and dangerous. And especially for um, black women who were seen um, as all who already um, their position in public was fraught, right? They weren't protected by the same kinds of respectability that white women um, were protected by. So um, it was really important for these um, suffragists like Clifford to write about their participation. And Clifford does say that, right, she sort of reminds us of the historic nature of the parade and emphasizes that black women were represented. Um, and also um, by insisting that they were marching throughout the parade, uh, the Chicago Broad Axe, which was also an African-American paper in um, Chicago, their headline said, no color line existed in any part of it, of the parade. And Afro-American women marched proudly side by side by their white sisters. And so it really emphasizes a rejection of the color line of segregation and this vision of equality. And those visions were under attack at that very moment as President Wilson took office. Um, he and his cabinet came in um, and he's the first Southern president elected um, since 1848. And he um, immediately begins to segregate the civil service and the office spaces of Washington. Carrie Williams Clifford's husband, William, is impacted by this. Um, his salary, he worked in the Treasury Department, and in July, just a few months later, his salary was cut from $1,600 to $1,400 a year. And his office spaces and those of other civil servants were being segregated. So curtains were put up between black and white employees, um, cafeterias were segregated, for the first time, bathrooms were segregated um, into black, uh, right, colored and white bathrooms. Um, and so all of this, um, right, were the very things that these black suffragists were, were marching against. And on a side note, um, the suffrage parade itself became um, kind of a national, even more of a national story because um, it was the first protest parade in the nation's capital. Um, where women got a permit to march down Pennsylvania Avenue. And so they were officially allowed to be there, but um, the police chief was not a supporter of women's suffrage and didn't think they should be there. He had resisted the permit. And so um, he and the police officers who are kind of keeping, uh, are meant to keep control of the parade don't do their jobs. And they let the crowd kind of surge onto the street around the parade. They actually stop it for a number, uh, for, you know, for a while. The women are kind of forced to march in between the streetcar tracks and they're kind of pushing through the crowd. Um, it, it gets so bad and it's so embarrassing because of just complete um, lack of control that Congress who has um, oversight over the District of Columbia actually um, insists on congressional testimony and hearings to find out what went so wrong. And it's particularly glaring because the inaugural parade the next day um, was very orderly, right? So it was clear, um, and as comes through in the testimony, that um, the police were just refusing to control the crowd. And there's lots of testimony from suffragists saying, I asked the police officer why he wasn't keeping control and they either laughed at me or told me I should have stayed home, right? Or just said, oh, I can't do anything. So that um, was resonating with me uh, as I was thinking about this talk. So that 1913 parade emphasizes the strategy of working for a federal amendment, but states um, are still, uh, there are still state efforts. Um, and I just wanna talk uh, briefly um, about uh, the Pennsylvania state uh, suffrage referendum, which is held in 1915. New York holds one that year as well. Um, 
And I'll just say a couple quick things because I know we're, we're coming, uh, the time is getting short. But basically, this was a really difficult proposition in Pennsylvania. Um, it had to pass the legislature in two consecutive sessions uh, with majorities, and then it went out to a vote um, you know, in a general election. Um, so the pen, women in Pennsylvania um, gear up for this starting around 1910. And um, you can see on the left, they use the Liberty Bell as their symbol. And as was usual, um, most of the images that we see, right, are of beautiful white women as, as um, representing suffrage. But black women were very involved in this um, in Pennsylvania as well. Um, they were frustrated initially um, in 1913 in Philadelphia, black suffragists argued that um, white suffragists, uh, white suffrage leaders were snubbing them. Um, and 150 black women show up at a suffrage meeting in Philadelphia to sort of really emphasize their determination to be part of this. And so white suffrage leaders get better. Um, and so black women are part of the leadership. Um, Harriet Lee, who was the wife of Minister Israel Lee from Pittsburgh, um, had organized um, a black suffrage organization there. And she's on the um, state executive board. She's delegate for Pennsylvania at some of the national um, organizations. But um, white and black women tended to work um, in their own organizations. Um, oh, this was just a, a, an emphasis, right, that there are black men who vote in Pennsylvania. So they sort of, um, to get, to, to be successful, they need to appeal to them as well. Um, and this is a picture of uh, the Pennsylvania um, Club, black, uh, the Pennsylvania Colored Women's Club. It's from 1923, but two of the women in the top uh, left and the top right. So top left is Ruth Bennett and the top right is Rebecca Aldridge. Um, uh, Aldridge is from Pittsburgh and Bennett was from Chester. And they're both major suffrage figures. Um, so the, the club women were absolutely part of this. Um, nationally famous black women like Mary Church Terrell and Alice Dunbar Nelson, who was the wife of um, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, tour Pennsylvania um, for this 1915 um, election and, and speak. Um, and so are really part of this, uh, this movement. Um, in Pennsylvania, the referendum fails, sadly, in 1915, but women keep fighting. And Pennsylvania is actually the seventh state to ratify the 19th Amendment when it um, finally passes Congress. Um, Pennsylvania ratifies in 1919, but it's another year until enough states, 36 of them, had ratified the 19th Amendment, officially making it part of um, the Constitution. So, um, but as I mentioned, and I'll just sum up here, 1920, um, right, women of color had been part of the fight for the amendment. It's successful in 1920, but not all of those women get to vote um, that year. So Black women in Pennsylvania are able to start voting, and they do, and you can see here that um, by 1921, they're already being touted as important political um, you know, kind of a political group. But um, in the South, Black women run into those same Jim Crow laws that keep Black men from voting. Native women um, are considered wards of the government, and that doesn't change in 1920. It finally changes in 1924. So the Native suffragists um, have to keep fighting uh, for not just suffrage rights, but, but citizenship rights for themselves as well as Native men. And so that's a struggle that continues after um, 1920. Um, Chinese women um, are unable to become naturalized citizens if they immigrate to the United States. Their fight continues until after World War II. And so really for a number of the, the women that I talk about, um, the struggle isn't over until the 1960s, right? And the 1965 Voting Act. Um, so, so one of the lessons we can take away from uh, the story of women of color is that the fight continues past 1920 um, and into the, the middle of the 20th century and that the Voting Rights Act was such an important piece of legislation um, for those groups. So I'll go ahead and, and stop there and then um, I'm happy to take questions and talk about um, any of uh, the things that I discussed or any more of those women that I mentioned at the beginning. So thank you.
Thank you, Kathleen. Um, so I think uh, there's some great questions here and um, we'll start with, um, as, you, as you spoke about, uh, Native Native women often coming from more matriarchal and more parity in their um, in their social relations, and wondering if you could talk about how that reality came into conflict with the patriarchal atmosphere in which we live in today. Um, so, right, definitely, that's definitely part of. Um, many of the assimilation programs were really aimed at um, changing the way that Native men and women behaved with each other. And so um, a lot of the um, boarding school uh, lessons were really about gender roles. So um, many of the children were expected to do work in those schools and it was very gendered. So boys were taught how to farm. Um, which for many, in many native um, cultures, women were the ones who were the agriculturalists. Um, girls were taught how to cook and clean and be in the homes, um, you know, and so that was absolutely something that um, kind of changing the way in which uh, those societies had different gender roles and making them conform with uh, the kinds of um, male and female ideals of white society was absolutely a huge part of what the federal policies were trying to do at precisely this time. Um, so that's a really good question. Yeah. I have a couple of people noting uh, that, that Kamala Harris is actually was Alpha Kappa Alpha, um, but Delta Sigma Theta, um, Pam McDonald points out, thank, hope, uh, wonderfully that today is actually uh, the International as Founders Day for Delta Sigma Theta. Um, so it was great to lift lift them up now and, and point out that this was a social action sorority. Um, interestingly, she said the 22 Delta founders had been members of AKA, but were expelled from that sorority because of their insistence on marching. Um, and that we now have uh, Delta Sigma Theta now has seven members uh, who are also members of Congress, and there'll be two members in the new cabinet who are, who are Deltas. So that's, and a woman like Shirley Chisholm was a Delta. So that, that's wonderful to be lifting up. Thank you, Pam, for lifting up um, the continued importance of, of the Delta Sigma Thetas. And so we all join in, in uh, Founders Day in, in celebrating the work that all of these strong women have been um, been, been doing for, for civil, civil, civil rights, for social justice, um, and a more equitable society from the beginning. Thank you for sharing that information. Yes, thank um, you. My apologies. Um, so she wonder 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 if you could speak more about the 1913 meeting of Black women in Philadelphia. Um, so that one, so um, I'm just starting to look at um, the Black women fight in um, Pennsylvania. I was doing some class, some of my class assignments this semester were looking at um, Pennsylvania specifically. And none of the women that I write about were from Pennsylvania. So this is fairly new research for me. Um, so that, what I have there is a couple of newspaper articles. Um, but definitely it seems like the black women in Pennsylvania, again, as they did in many cases, um, were really insistent that they were going to be a part of these conversations um, and that they showed up and that there were large numbers of them. So that, that meeting, right, the reporting is there are 150 women. And then um, in newspaper reports and in the, um, uh, the, the records of the National, um, uh, National Colored Women's Clubs, uh, there's a there's a lot of information. There are a lot of names. Um, so I'm trying to track down some of those names. Most of them seem to be in Pittsburgh and Philly, and then the the sort of um, towns around them. But there also there's a group in Harrisburg. Um, there seem to be um, folks in York. So they're they're kind of across the state. Um, and again, that's sort of a story that um, I think needs deserves more. Um, needs to be highlighted. So right now I'm, I'm tracking, trying to track some of the names. Um, there's a great database um, 
though I don't know how accessible it is, I don't know if the Anthenaeum has it, the Women in Social Movements database, um, where people crowdsourced um, sort of the short biographies of African American suffragists across the country um, as part of the suffrage centennial. And so um, some of the women from Pennsylvania are in there, but not all of them. So there's definitely, you know, this centennial has been really incredible in terms of um, uncovering some of these stories or highlighting some of these stories, um, but there's still a lot more room for um, research and um, discussion. And I, you know, people, definitely the Ida B. Wells story, I noticed that um, came up a couple times. And yeah, that she, again, the sort of insistence um, that she's told she can't march with the Illinois um, group, that she's, she has to march in the back and she refuses to, and she steps into the parade um, sort of as they've already begun marching. Um, and again, making clear that she is going to march where she's gonna march. And she says, I don't do this for myself. I do this for the future benefit of my entire race. Um, so I, I agree with Pam, right? And I'm sorry it didn't come through, but absolutely that um, for a lot of these women, black women, but also native women, um, the, the struggle for voting rights was a, about a community-wide struggle, right? That, um, that it wasn't just women who were um, disenfranchised in these groups, it was men and women. Um, and that there, that's in um, the, the speeches and it's in the um, writings of, of these women that absolutely this is about their communities um, and it's broader than just individual women for sure, so. Thank you for pointing that out. And I am sorry it didn't come through that way. So uh, Steve asks, um, China became the only nation in the world that was prohibited from Im immigration to this country. Um, well, Japan uh, also after 1924. Uh, this, uh, this was after the Chinese did the work to build the railroads. Correct. Chinese women had especially difficult times immigrating to this country. They were forced to become prostitutes often in, in San Francisco. Did that history contribute to the difficulties of Chinese women gaining the right to vote? Yeah, absolutely. So um, you're, you're correct that in, so after the Civil War in 1875, the first sort of law restricting um, immigration um, it, it doesn't necessarily say Chinese women, but it's basically aimed at Chinese women as the Page Act. Um, and it's because they're perceived, any Chinese woman immigrating is perceived to be coming as a sex worker. Um, so that law um, keeps prostitutes out. Um, and then in 1882, there's another, the Chinese Exclusion Act is passed, which essentially says that, that there are like three tiny exceptions, but overall no Chinese um, immigrants are going to be allowed to come to the United States. And any that do under those very small exceptions are not allowed to naturalize. So they can never become citizens. Um, so the many of the Chinese women that I, um, that I write about, that I look at, are not naturalized citizens. They cannot become US citizens. Um, and their suffrage activism in the US then addresses these immigration policies, um, is fighting against these stereotypes about themselves, right? As the, they're all perceived as prostitutes. Um, and also against perceptions about China itself that resulted in these laws. Um, so again, their fight for suffrage is really bound up in these larger um, issues. And they're also very connected to the women's movement in China. And what's happening there is that uh, the Chinese revolution of 1911, a Republican revolution, not, not the communist, um, had actually um, the Republican revolutionaries strongly supported women's rights and initially supported suffrage um, in China. It's a very complicated story, but they then use that, they use that transnational conversation um, and in their conversations with white suffragists to say, look, look at China, look at how much progress, how much further they are, uh, how much further ahead they are than um, Americans, right? That they've enfranchised women, which they think has happened briefly. Um, it doesn't happen or it, it is taken away pretty quickly. But so those, all of um, 
those questions about immigration, the stereotypes about China that lead to those exclusion acts are absolutely part of Chinese women's activism. Now your, um, you know, your, 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 your particular area of research has, has been in Native American uh, history of women's rights. And, and I'm, I'm curious to, to hear from you as, as Native women continue to fight for suffrage and full recognition as citizens and, and all of those rights after 1920, were there any allies who stepped in with them um, in that fight? Or after <laughs> white women felt they won their rights in, in 1920, did, you know, did, did folks step away and did the movement splinter even more? So um, there were some, some white women who were allied and some who were not. Um, so for example, Gertrude Bonin, um, who's one of the women I write about, goes to Alice Paul in 1921 and says, Native women still right, can't, can't vote. There, there's this whole category of people who can't vote, Native women and men, you know, could you work on that? Um, and it's just part of a conference where um, a number of, of questions are raised about what the National Women's Party might work on now. And um, Alice Paul and the National Women's Party, of course, end up focusing on um, the Equal Rights Amendment, kind of seeing that as the next step. But um, the General Federation of Women's Clubs, um, which is a, a white um, organization, has a couple million members, very big. Uh, they actually take up Gertrude Bonin's um, question and they hire her as a speaker and she tours the country speaking to to them mm -hmm. um, and they uh, within that organization there are a number of women who really advocate for um, Indian citizenship which is what Bonin wants now not all native people wanted U.S. citizenship and not all native people agreed that voting in U.S. elections was the way to um, sort of address federal policies there were absolutely native people and native women at the time who said we have our own nations um, that are sovereign and we shouldn't be, um, right, they reject US citizenship. Um, so the Haudenosaunee or the Iroquois um, in particular are very vocal about rejecting that. So there's not a unified sense of, um, you know, whether or not voting in US elections is the, is the way, but, but Gertrude Bonin certainly thinks so. And she definitely finds allies with this General Federation of Women's Clubs and that's um, right. Some of that pressure to pass what becomes the 1924 Indian Citizenship Act comes from that activism. So I'm wondering, as you did this research for this, and it was a you were commissioned uh, to 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 write this for the suffrage celebration this past year. What surprised you in your in your research? Mm. Oh. Um, I actually think that the, the story of the Chinese women was the most surprising to me, um, the most um, unfamiliar. I mean, I, I, I was in the field of native history, so some of these women were familiar to me before I wrote the book. Um, there is definitely um, a large scholarship and an increasing scholarship, particularly um, during this sort of suffrage centennial on African-American women. Um, as uh, suffragists and, and advocates for voting rights. Um, and so, the, but the, the story of the Chinese women and its connections to the Chinese revolution um, were much more unfamiliar to me. Um, and so that one really became, uh, was really a place that I learned a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, thank you. I have uh, a few people here. I've, I've, I've called out a few other names. I think in 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 light of Delta's founder days to, to lift up um, Stacey Abrams, um, uh, Grace Bustle and Sarah Mounts Douglas in Philadelphia, Gertrude Bustle Mossell, um, who wrote about obtaining the vote. Um, so thank you to Barbara and to Joyce for lifting them up and. Um, I also hear that there are two other important black sororities, uh, Sigma Gamma Rho and Zeta Phi Beta um, also. So, so thank you for, for sharing all those. This is a, a start of a, of a conversation that obviously um, has many 
many avenues and lanes to walk down um, to, to explore more deeply. And um, we're so grateful to Kathleen for coming tonight and coming up to continue the conversation on February 9th, we have Koa Beck, who is the founder of the magazine Jezebel, in conversation with Camille mm -hmm. Perry about her book, White Feminism, whom, From the Suffragettes to Influencers and Who They Leave Behind. And then on the 11th, we have Michelle Jester, who, Duster, who is an educator and historian and also the great granddaughter of Ida B. Wells, who will be here to talk about her, her most recent book, Ida B. the Queen, The Extraordinary Life and Legacy of Ida B. Wells. I, several folks have, have mentioned her in the... Um, in the chat Q and A section. So more opportunities to engage in conversation. And we're so glad for all of you who came and joined us tonight and for sharing with us and for Dr. Cahill and um, what she learned and for sharing with us too. This has been wonderful. Uh, upcoming events, got those right up here. Um, yes, uh, coming up also on Tuesday, we'll be at noon, my, my Books with Beth Club, just a chance each month to sit down and talk together, read and con converse together about books that I have been reading and thinking about.